Uh, good morning, everyone. Can I just ask, how many of you are from Coventry? So you all know the city, as I said on Monday, to maybe some of you as well, better than I do, OK? So, OK, right. Um, I think what we should do, maybe, is to start with Lady Godiva. Um, Lady Godiva is... You will know that I actually come from Plymouth and wrote the equivalent book on Plymouth's post-war history. Plymouth has Francis Drake, Coventry has Lady Godiva, yes. you know. So the sort of iconography um, of Coventry is sort of Lady Godiva. And Lady Godiva here um, was a gift from a developer called Bassett Green, I think actually in the late 30s originally, because Lady Godiva in this sort of form pops up on drawings in Coventry from about 1940 onwards. Um, but she doesn't appear here uh, until 1949. There's an inscription on the back which gives you all of those details. Um, as a gift to the people of Coventry. Um, so the city it was intended for uh, was actually very different from the city that it started from. It's by William Reed Dick. Um, who was a London sculptor that many of you will know for his war memorials and other sculpture. His studio in West London has only very recently been listed, I think, grade two star by Historic England. I think that's right. Um, but you'll find Reed Dick's work all over the place. Um, and the question was where to put it, and the answer clearly was Broadgate. Broadgate in the late 1930s was the centre of Coventry, uh, a slightly different shape. Um, and certainly a very different appearance to what it is now. But it was the sort of centre of town. And all the streets converged on Broadgate, and there was a big major shopping street down there called Smithford Street. You're not singing? Um, I'm not going to sing. No, I'm not going to sing. No, I promise I, promise I won't sing. Um, um, there was a big street down there with a major shop, and this was the main shopping and commercial district of Coventry. Um, the development of Coventry was, as I say, a political act um, by the Labour Party, which was elected to Coventry in 19, late 1937. Uh, and that administration was headed up by a man called George Hodgkinson, who was a trade unionist, a member of the... came up through the Independent Labour Party and eventually was secretary of the Labour Party in Coventry, who had a vision of a socialist city as a sort of reaction against the failure of the first Labour government of, of Macdonald, Ramsay Macdonald, you know, which had failed to put in all the things that the voters who had voted for them thought they ought to have done. And Coventry, through the 30s, was governed by a coalition of Conservatives and Liberals, um, which, as far as one can make out, was pretty inactive. Um, although Coventry was a thriving city, because of the engineering industries that it was then supporting and booming. I mean, you know, cars, aero engines, armaments, telephones, you know, um, fabrics from Courtauld, and, and all those great names were Coventry names. Um, actually, it didn't spend money on very much, except a certain amount of council housing in the, in the suburbs. Um, but the city centre more or less was sort of left alone and gradually it became more and more and more unworkable. There were car factories, well, just around here, um, for example, which had nowhere to, to go, you know, nowhere to, to expand and so on. Um, so there was a need to replan Coventry. Uh, more or less Coventry consisted of odd feature buildings which had arrived sort of around the First World War. We'll see some of those. Um, and, and late medieval, and so on, half-timbered buildings, of which we'll see a very few as we go around. Um, but, I mean, it was, you know, billed as a sort of medieval city. It's not really true, it, it wasn't. But, I mean, it was billed as that um, uh, uh, in the 1930s. So, um, I won't go on about the Blitz, but people in Coventry, I'm afraid, do go on about the Blitz. Um, you know, um, and... Um, it's one of, I mean, it is extraordinary how many books there are about the Coventry <laughs> Brits. Um, but, I mean, uh, November the 14th, 1940, um, Coventry was blitzed. The first provincial city to be blitzed. Uh, the only 
uh, provincial, well, the only cathedral in Britain to be destroyed by the war. Great, therefore, a great symbol of the Blitz and so on. Um, and that cleared the centre of Coventry around here. There were photographs of all of this area with sort of ruined buildings sort of amongst a lot of very destroyed buildings, particularly down in that direction. Um, well, George Hodgkinson had decided he was going to rebuild the city anyway, and there are various wonderful quotes from uh, his architect appointed in 1938, Donald Gibson, um, and indeed Hodgkinson, about what the future city could be. But the real problem was we haven't got the cleared sites and we don't own the land to do it. And of course, along came what in the end was called a great opportunity, uh, which was the clearance of the city. The same story was, of course, happening in the East End of London. It was certainly happening in Plymouth, Southampton, Bristol, Hull, um, a little bit in other cities as well, but you know they were all facing the same problem. Let's stop talking about history and just look at the clock. It's very important. Cameras out, cameras out, everyone, because with luck, Lady Godiva will appear. <laughs> Here, oh gosh, I love this. It's well done, better yeah. than television, isn't it? <laughs> 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 <Very tiny camera>. <laughs> <laughs> This is designed by a sculptor called Trevor Tennant and made by the local technical college using a clock mechanism rescued from an older building. And the bell at the side was rescued from an older building. <laughs> we are now on the axis which Gibson created, which went down through his new city centre. Now we can't see it, but in that direction finishes yeah. at the spire of the cathedral. So the cathedral spire remained, the nave which we'll see later on was in ruins, and he drew this grand axis all the way down through this bit of Coventry and said, around that I shall plan a new city. And really by 1942 the basis of that city was in place. And the idea that the shopping centre, which was going to be here, would be pedestrianised. That is, cars and people were separated. And that was the great revolution that happened in Coventry and happened in Coventry first. And that idea went through any number of other plans through the 1940s into the 1950s. Um, but it stayed. It stayed there and it influenced a whole generation of architects. It comes, I guess, from Patrick Abercrombie, who was teaching at Liverpool University, where Gibson did his planning degree, he did his architecture at Manchester. But of course the Beaux-Arts system of axes and spaces was the way that architects in those days and planners indeed were taught. Um, but I think it's a strong dose of, Donald, of, of Patrick Abercrombie on, on you know, influencing British planning in general and Gibson in particular um, in Coventry. And it's interesting that you know, all the advisors and people that, that influenced Coventry really came through the Liverpool educational system. <coughs> the architects came from Liverpool and from Birmingham. Birmingham was also teaching the same sort of idea. So there's a so strong local-ish influence um, as well on, on Gibson and his staff in all sorts of different styles and it's interesting that the city which was all about technical innovation the motor car industry etc etc um, didn't really have innovation as far as its architecture was concerned what we're looking at the half timbered job through there is allegedly steel framed um, an office building from the late 1930s. I still cannot find out who the architects were and I have never found any drawings for it. If anyone ever finds any, please, please publish it. Um, it copies, of course, real medieval buildings which are in behind it. Um, but that street was, again, one of the major shopping streets. It led down to a sort of modernist art deco uh, theatre. Um, which survived the war and was only destroyed relatively recently. Um, so there was that as a new building. Um, and then there was the town hall, which was in the sort of Tudor style, which we'll come round to see, which is up round that way. So Coventry was experimenting with all sorts of styles. And, of course, there were classical banks. The bank here, um, the headquarters, local headquarters, was the National Provincial Bank. 
uh, late 19, well, early 1930s, and next to it we'll see in a second Lloyd's Bank, in the sort of banker's classical. It's actually darn good banker's classical, and if you get a bit of time later on, you could go into the halls, wear your togas to sort of blend in properly, you know, because they are sort of splendidly Roman inside. Um, but they were the sort of sharp new architecture, if you like, of 1920s, 1930s Coventry. Um, so it certainly was not into modernism. Gibson's plan developed through the 1940s, and he invents an architecture for Coventry, an architecture which can be used for different types of buildings, different sizes, different types and so on. Um, lots of frustration about getting it through the ministry, it gets delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, other cities like Plymouth for example are busy building while Coventry is still scratching its head and thinking about what it's going to do and when it's going to do it. But under Hodgkinson, the city council become the developers for the city centre, which is very, very, very unusual. Um, usually, you know, it was councils inviting developers in with, with their architects. Coventry is a huge exception from that point of view. So a lot of uh, the buildings in the city centre are directly designed by the city architects department, uh, or they are designed in accordance with the city architects department and approved by them. So, Broadgate House that we're looking at across here um, is designed by Donald Gibson and his department. Uh, the designs emerge from about 1944 onwards. Um, and what we're seeing now is more or less on the drawing board by about 1948 or so. Any number of iterations of it, some of them even with sort of curvy cornered windows and all sorts of interesting variations. Um, but this idea of blocks making corners, link blocks between being more horizontal, blocks on corners, blocks on corners made of brick. They circle around Lady Godiva, who sits in the middle of a big lawn with gardens, um, and they deliver people to the city centre, and it becomes pedestrianised from this point on. The ramp is a 1980s addition before you would have been able to see right the way down into the precinct in there. Looking at this facade, um, with its very obviously non-structural brickwork, you know, it's cladding, it's brickwork as cladding. Um, the original windows, the crystal or crystal type metal windows are still here. And although the big lift box there has been re-clad, uh, the colour and the size of the cladding is about right. Um, and then round the back, one day when you've got more time, you'll find it's all brick with little round windows in it, um, looking for all the world like a little bit of dewdock or something like that from Holland. Um, there's a great big structure set back from the facade with mushroom columns inside. Um, again, maybe looking back to a sort of 1930s structure. But I, I think this is still, even with the recladding, um, one of the best buildings of the time in Coventry, and certainly the right scale. You know, it's, it's saying this is a city scale, it's big and massive, and this is what the new Coventry should look like. So you get the point when you see the three buildings together of making a place in the city. And on that last column on the end there, um, there are all, the, all these, the initials of all the people involved on the project. And it's quite a nice challenge to take that column, the one with Timpson's sign strapped across it. Um, and there's Donald Gibson's initials, um, Fred Pooley, who later become, became county architect of Buckinghamshire, is there as an architect. Raymond Ash, who became county architect of Surrey, is there. Brian Bunch, who designed Stevenage, is there. And many others. Um, a distinguished lot, actually. Here's the crossing. Access to the cathedral, and Gibson's idea was that these little streets, which were specifically not taller than any of the cathedrals or churches, um, would just melt into the existing plan as they stretched into the older city. Um, but Arthur Ling was sort of totally against that idea. He wanted something much more complicated, uh, more influenced by Gordon Cullen's townscape, certainly more influenced, I think, by the line barn in Rotterdam 
and by Vellingby, the satellite suburb of Stockholm. Um, I have a photograph in the book of Arthur Ling standing in the line barn, so we know he knew about that. Um, but I think he was a guy who really knew an awful lot about European architecture. He was an expert on Russian architecture, I mean Soviet Russian architecture, because he was a communist. Ling knew about planning in Moscow, and you know the Stalin plan for Moscow has these great towers, and that certainly influenced Ling. I mean, he introduced the first tower blocks of the city. Um, and he was certainly influenced by Soviet architecture. There's no doubt about that at all. Although this is rather more modest and actually <laughs> rather prettier. Um, so anyway, we have the upper precinct by Gibson, lower precinct very much altered by Arthur Ling from 1955 onwards, finished in the early 60s. Um, you could just pick it out still. There's the Lady Godiva Restaurant Cafe, which is the circular drum. Um, and then shops only on each side, because there was no need for offices, and there was no demand for offices whatsoever. Um, and then the fourth block for the corner was filled in, not with shopping, but with the Locarno uh, dance hall. And the Locarno's entrance was a glass tower in the middle of here. There's a <laughs> photograph in the book. I.e., this is a pedestrian place. There is now no room for traffic. We have stopped the traffic by putting this glass box in the middle. Um, so the Locarno with um, mosaics by a, an artist called Fred Millett, which are quite fun, was up above shopping. And the canopy did continue around the corner. The point was that the street was axial to Hillman House, the first of the inner city towers, um, designed by Ling's department, um, a chap called Michael McClellan, who was an extremely good architect. Um, and it's sort of based on a Frank Lloyd Wright tower, sort of. Um, but when you look at them both together, they're not really. There's a sort of impression of it. But I think the idea was to get this sort of interesting profile. Um, but one of the problems, obviously, is that the core comes right down in the busiest bit, i.e. the exit to the shopping street. Yeah. So you get this rather odd <laughs> core coming down sort of in the wrong place, you know. Um, and that's a, a trick as we walk through. Let's, let's just glance left as you go along with some early 50s shops by Gibson with very curious columns for the arcade. The stone, this ginger stone, by the way, I should say, is Haunton stone. And again, it's used consistently in Gibson's time um, for columns. Um, but there was similar on the other side, now destroyed. Let's go right through and then turn down Corporation Street. We're, we're now in Corporation Street, um, which was a pre-war improvement under Ernest Ford, the city engineer. So his idea was to bring a sort of tight in in a ring road and this is the only major bit of it which ever got built um, so this is a pre-war road which Gibson sort of adapted to his plan so one axis arrives here and I think the arrival of the axes onto these old streets was never very satisfactory I mean <laughs> here, here done in a sort of thin 1960s curtain wall um, but the arcading of the streets as you see here, is certainly from Gibson's plan. This is the Coventry Evening Telegraph building by, yes, local architects, Colourford and Partners, um, and I've got a data finished in 1960 for this. So already it's beginning to look a bit out of date. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, Ling invents um, Belgrade Square here, um, which was originally part of the sort of solid part of the city under Gibson plan, uh, with the Belgrade Theatre next to it. The Belgrade Theatre, the first uh, provincial new theatre opened after the war, heavily sponsored by the Arts Council, you know, who were all about putting in new theatres into the provinces like Nottingham, um, Canterbury, Chichester and so on. But this was the first, designed by Ling's department, um, now listed Grade 2, I'm glad to say. Uh, but this was not intended when it was designed to face the square. Um, that's the foyer's entrance is in the front, in 
and you go in along the foyer, along the side of the building, and then the theatre is in behind there. It's a sort of mini festival hall, if you like, inside. And the architects told me that they, it has boxes in there, but there was huge debate in the department whether it should have any boxes at all, because that was... Elitist. Elitist. <laughs> at the Belgrade Theatre. So its, it's entrance was originally this way into the foyer.